Here we go. What is up, everybody? Thank you so much for being here. I'm so super excited about this interview with Yindra Velasquez, our first interview, folks. Um, and I'm super pumped for it. So thank you so much for being here. Uh, I just really quickly want to say, um, whenever we have a guest on, we uh, you know give them an option. If there's anything we don't, they don't want to talk about, we don't bring it up. Uh, so if there's a particular topic that there's questions on and you don't see me responding or we don't bring it up, that is why. So just a heads up. Um, but it's not a big deal. So just want to give you guys a heads up. Um, but I want you guys to take a second, close your eyes if, if you're not familiar with this case. And just imagine your childhood friends that you used to hang out with, you used to like, you know, ride bikes with a couple of childhood friends. They're great friends. They're good friends of yours. You grow up with them, you go to high school with them, then you, you know, you're friends with them as an adult, so much so that one of them um, is, uh, she's the godmother of your child. So great friends, you're gonna have a vacation together, go to Disney World, and then all of a sudden you find out one of them, the husband, is arrested for murder. Can you imagine that? And then you're sucked into trials, FBI surveilling you, just like insane amount of things because you got caught in this web of the Adelsons and it just blows my mind that this happened. So uh, we have Yindra Velasquez, which this happened to, uh, and I'm so excited to talk to her. So I am going to bring her on right now. Everyone, welcome Yindra Velasquez. How are you, Yindra? I'm great. How are you, Jay? I am great. Thank you so much uh, for coming on with me. I really appreciate it. Um, I kind of want to start this out by just, if you could just introduce yourself and just tell the folks about yourself a little bit, whatever you want to talk about. One thing I know we found out recently on Twitter, you are a true crime fan. So tell us about that and just a little bit about yourself. Yeah. yeah so crime thing really started with me when I was young. I used to 48. I think I've watched every single episode of the first 48. I really sad when Miami first 48 was canceled, to be honest. Uh, but that's a different story. Um, I think I used to watch <laughs> um, CSI Miami, CSI, you know, all of those. As I was growing up, I was like, well, what do I want to do with my life? You know, at first I wanted to be, then I became pregnant with my wife. I decided not to do it because I was like, you know, that line of work is, you know, when you have children and it's, you know, it's not very safe. So I took that into account. But well, you know, I think I, I want to do something criminal, you know, I decided to do criminal justice and criminology. And then from there, um, you know, the forensic science thing for me, you know, I'm a science nerd. Um, my daughter now is a science nerd. She loves it. Um, so I delved into that. And that's where that passion started. Honestly, I think I watch so many crazy shows i have my kids are into some of the shows that i watch i don't let them watch everything because you know not everything is easy. but um i am definitely into most of the crime shows and i follow a lot of trials and stuff like that and i'll have patients with a lot of people that follow this the trials as well on them because you know i have more of a broad view and opinions on things sometimes i play devil's advocate and i'm like but what if um, so that's that's really how I got into it. So it's kind of pretty wild that you 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 know follow that stuff and then all of a sudden you are in a case, a true crime case. I mean, 
just wild to think that um as someone who like because all of us pretty much all of us here who are my, follow my channel are true crime fans so just take a step back and imagine all of a sudden very wild you know, <laughs> so if you could take us if you want to talk just a little bit about um you know growing up with katie and sigfredo um before kind of everything went yeah, down yeah for what, what, what sure everything like? You, uh, you break it up a little. She, are you making up me? She's like, are you sure you're ready to talk about this? You know, a long time. And, you know, it's really, it's been crazy to be honest with you. Um, from just being superiors over, over and over again. Um, my house was surrounded by one time, um, you know, the FBI visiting my job. Just so many, th you know, I was on a podcast without knowing I was going to be on a podcast. So the, the Over My Dead Body was kind of accidental because I was taking out garbage, walking down my street and just stopped me outside and started wow. talking to me. So I so ended up on no this idea. podcast. Yeah. When things, um, you know, no, I didn't. Initially, like, so the street that I lived on, um, you know, we didn't have sidewalks. A lot of people would travel through that street to go to the main street where there was public transportation. So this gentleman is just walking tree with his backpack. You know, it's a young, young guy. I'm thinking, hey, you know, he's just, you know, it was no big deal. And he was like, well, are you so-and-so? And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, well, you know, I, I'm doing this, this podcast thing and I'm doing some research for it for school. And I wanted to see if, if you wanted to talk to me a little bit. And I said, okay, no problem. So he starts talking to me about the case and I'm just like, okay, obviously I don't know many details of the case per se, um, because thankfully I wasn't privy to any of the information, but, um, you know, obviously there was a storyline there, right? He wanted to know, you know, how I knew them and, you know, how I knew each party that was involved and things like that. So, you know, if you listen to that podcast, you do hear me on there on one of the episodes and you'll hear, you know, exactly what I say about just my relationship with the. Wow. Uh, are you hearing me? All right. I think you're breaking up a little bit. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, I hear you fine. Can you hear me? Oh, okay. Okay, awesome. Um, so I it mean, could can you be take my this headphones. Back? I wonder if I get off of them. Let me see. Okay, try that. Okay. Sorry, guys, we're just working on this now. We're going to see that um, maybe it's a, uh... oh, no, are you frozen? Yinjur, are you there? Sorry, guys, we're just working on this. We're working through this. Uh, Yinjur, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, all right. So I, I think we're. I think we're back now. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Some I, I, the chat's saying you're frozen, but I think uh, I think it's better okay. now. I think you're better now. I think we're good. Uh, yeah, it might have so been yeah, my could you tell us about for whatever reason. Sometimes that does it. Um, yeah, that messes up the glitches somehow. So awesome. All right, I think we're good now. All right, awesome. Um, can you tell us about when you're, you're so you're planning a trip to Disney, right? Um, and all of a sudden you find out. That yeah. Sigfredo is, is arrested. Tell us about that moment when you when you find that out. So we were leaving on that Friday. And so I went into work on Thursday. And at that time, Katie worked with me in my office. So not with me directly, but she worked with a realtor in my office. She was an assistant there to the realtor. But she shared my office space because I had my own office. I was a manager there. And I had a little space in my office that she could just sit down and use her computer and use her phone. And it didn't bother me. I didn't have any other employees. It was just me. 
So no big deal. So I go into the office about 8.30. I was not looking at my phone at all because I was driving in. So I get into my office, I taking out my stuff for my bag, and I take out my phone, and I have a text message from a close friend that actually is a mutual friend of Katie and Sigfredo and myself. So I get a text message from her, and it's a link to the Sun Sentinel news story, the breaking news with his mugshot of the story. And I'm like, what is this? So, you know. You know, I click on it, start reading the story. And as I'm re reading, I'm like, what is going on? What I did put together after a few minutes of the shock, um, you know, 10, 15 minutes in, I'm like, this occurred in Tallahassee. Tallahassee. I was like, Wendy lives in Tallahassee. And I'm like, Wendy's husband is Dan. So now everything's coming together and I'm like, oh my God, this gentleman that's dead is Wendy's husband and Wendy is Charlie's sister. So everything started to just come together at that moment. Like it was just like, you know, um, I was like, this is happening. Like this, this is wild. I'm like, we're leaving to Disney tomorrow. Right. What? So in my head, I'm like, they did this, like they arrested him because they clearly have been watching us and they know we are leaving to Disney. So maybe there's a fear that he leaves to Disney and just never comes back and just disappears some way, somehow. Maybe in their head, they thought, you know, this was a scapegoat, you know, they're gonna leave, you know, maybe at one point, maybe they thought I was involved. Um, I wasn't sure what they were thinking, to be completely honest. I didn't know the depth of it until a month later when the FBI came to the office. Well, let's talk about that. So correct me if I'm wrong, but you thought there were some folks outside working, doing work in your neighborhood in a van, right? But it turns out that wasn't the case. Talk about that. Yes. No. So there was a house across the street that was being completely remodeled. So an investor purchased the house, they gutted it, and they were doing a lot of work. And honestly, in the neighborhood that I lived in, um, a lot of houses would be remodeled, you know, here and there, new roofs, all of that. So I didn't find it suspicious that there was work vans outside. It, it, it was normal. So there was a white always parked in the front of I said, well, you know, that's the contractor or whoever it is, you know, the handyman, you know, I thought, and, you know, it got to a point that I couldn't even drive anymore because I, you know, I was having a little bit of a rough pregnancy at the end. Um, so I really wasn't paying attention to those things. I was just like, oh, these are people that are working here. It wasn't until the FBI came and was like, yeah, we've been sitting in front of your house for about a year. And wow. I was like, oh, my God, now I know who it was. Like, it was that white van that was sitting there for a year. And I had no idea. Like, you know, I led my life normal and, you know, I would go to work. And at that time, I had my other daughter that was already um, seven at the time. So it was normal, you know, I would get home from work. I had I had a schedule, you know, I, I thrive on schedules and I had a schedule. So they pretty much knew exactly what I would do and when I would do it. And also she was in my house pretty much every day or every other day. We had keys to each other's houses. So she was constantly there or she was picking me up or she would drive me to doctor's appointments at the end of my pregnancy because I couldn't drive anymore. So yeah, you know, taking me to the doctor. It was just, it was really crazy when I found out that they had been sitting there for a year. So now is that Pat Sanford? Does he come to your work with the, who comes to your, to your work and lets you know, and, and what do they say to you once they, when they yes. do this? Sanford and um, Isom. Say his last name, but both. Isom, Isom. It was it was a Taco Tuesday. I'll never forget that. 
so it's taco uh, it's taco tuesday they come into your job and what do they tell you so you know it's about 3 30 in the afternoon or so and they come in originally they didn't come to speak to me they came looking for her so they come to the office the receptionist you know they ask the receptionist hey is catherine here so the receptionist is like there's no catherine here that i know of but let me ask the office manager so they ask the office manager the office man that's the girl that used to sit in yendra's office let me go ask she comes to my office i had a glass office a glass door and she has a sticky and it has Katie's name on it. And she shows me the sticky and she's like, hey, is this the girl that used to sit in here? And I'm looking at her and at the thing from my face because I'm like, why would she be asking me that? Red flags, you know? So right. she's like, yes. And they're like, well, is she, is she coming back? Do you know anything? And I was like, I don't think she's coming back. And the lady was like, well, the FBI agents in the front and I'm going to let them know. I was like. So she goes to the front. She tells them, hey, she's not coming back. But, you know, her friend is here. Um, and that's what she's telling me. So, you know, obviously they ask her, who's the friend? And she tells them Yendra. And they're like, oh, that girl we want to talk to. So and that was that. Like I called my dad and I knew that it was going to be a long night. I, I already knew. And a not only a long night, but that is the beginning of the process, right? Where you, all of a sudden you're getting subpoenaed. You have to get deposed. Like this is a whole thing that you've just gotten sucked into in that, in that one con like that, once you get that, that's it, right? Like how your life changes from that forward to going into, uh, you know, what, what Ruth Mark Hell calls, the, the, I guess the trial life. It's kind of like you are to now, your life is like yes. upside down, right? Like, what is that like to now start getting subpoenaed? Like one, at one point, didn't like four cops come up to your house? Like talk about when you got subpoenaed, like. So when I originally was subpoenaed, so for the de deposition, they actually emailed me. So for the deposition, it was fine, you know? Um, but for being subpoenaed to go and testify the first time. So I had moved. So the home that they were watching for a year, um, they were foreclosing on that home um, that I, you know, I was renting that home. So I moved out of there. I, you know, I saved up money and I moved out to a new place. I didn't think that I needed to inform anybody that I was moving. You know, like I wasn't a material witness that I knew of. You know, I didn't know anything about the case. So I didn't think it was, uh, you know, there was a reason for me to even tell anybody, hey, I'm moving. So um, it's about seven in the morning one day. Um, at that time, uh, my ex-husband was still, we were still together. And so he was in the house and I was about to leave. So I was parking the car in the back and there was like an alleyway in the back. So I would park back there because we didn't have enough space in the front. And so I'm in the back and I'm loading the kids in the car like a regular day and you know, he swings the back door open and he's like, there are four cops in the front and they're banging on the door and they're asking for you. And I'm like super confused, not even nervous because on anything. So I'm like, this has to be some sort of mistake. Like what is going on? Um, so I'm like, okay. And I was like, well, stay with the kids. I'm going to go see what's up. You know, I open the front door. There's four cops there guns surrounding the cars that are parked, like blocking them in so that nobody can leave. And, you know, they're just holding the paper in their hand. And the gentleman, the cop looks at me and the first thing he says to me, he goes, this must be a very big case because they've been looking for you for a year and they sent us out. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And I grab the paper and as soon as I see, you know, state of Florida versus Catherine McBanwa, I knew what it was. And I was like, oh, my God, I'm being subpoenaed to testify at this trial. Wow. And my world came crashing down because that was the least thing that I wanted to do. Um, you know, I wanted to stay as far away as possible. 
Um, even when she was arrested, I spoke to her a couple of times after um, uh, Sefreda was arrested, not her, I'm sorry. Um, I only spoke to her a couple of times and it was very, very small talk. Hey, how are you? How are you keeping up? And how are the kids? No talk about the trial, no talk about the case, no talk about anything. I really, the less I knew, the better, pretty much. Well, first of all, kudos to you for doing what you did and cooperating and testifying in these trials. Like we've seen people that try to avoid this and you did it and you didn't have to. And like really big props to you. And by the way, we watched your, your trial. We watched your today. Some of us watched your first testimony and you were just so awesome. You're the type of witness that, that we like to watch someone who's honest, someone who's not trying to add, you know, details to stuff. You just told the truth. You told your story and it was awesome. So first of all, thank you for that. Um, it, it was great. Uh, thank you so much. Um, thank you. I mean, to me, it was easy because it's like, if you're not lying and you're not making anything up, your story is never going to change ever. Um, and I think that I had the same exact wording pretty much both times that I testified, like nothing really changed. Like I, my paperwork and I read over my transcripts and, you know, I studied them over and over because of course it's years, you know, this, this, the first arrest was in 2016. We are now in 2024. And even when I first testified, it was three years in. So, and so much happened within those three years, you know, like that's not the first thing on the top of my head. You know, I'm dealing with life, children, work, everything in between, you know? So it, it was definitely hard. It was, I had a lot of anxiety uh, for a long time. Um, even though like, I didn't even know that the trial was gonna be streamed, you know, that, that so many people were gonna be watching me. And I think that that was a big part of my anxiety. You know, I'm like, people judge me, you know, why is she friends with this person? You know, but it's like, you don't know these things, you know, like the person that I knew and that I met and that I had in my life for so long was not that person. So that's why it messes me up so much because I'm like, you know, if you guys knew that Katie, if you guys knew that Sigfredo, um, they're different people. Completely different. Well, that, well, that's what you're here for. So why don't you tell us what what was that Katie like, and what was that Sigfredo like that you knew prior to this all happening? What were they like? Listen, to tell you the truth, a lot of people. I mean, Sigfredo looks like a very scary guy. Um, you know, you see him; he is intimidating. You know, he is a big guy. I'm also a very little person. I am five one on a good day, um, but you know, he's he's a big dude. You know, his eyes are intimidating. He has like those piercing green eyes. Um, but honestly, with my kids and even with me, always very respectful. Um, he was a big teddy bear with the children. Um, never gave me any inkling that he would be involved in something like this. Yes, we knew that he had done stuff in the past and, you know, he had a history with drugs and, you know, petty things. You know, things would you would say victimless crimes, you know, um, but I would never think that he would get to the point of doing something like this. And her, she didn't even have a parking ticket. Not even a parking ticket. So the thing for me was when I found out that this was going on and that they had gotten paid and I'm like, that doesn't make any sense, especially for her, because no habits changed. So you think, you know, somebody gets paid to do a job, right? A job like this. You think they're going to start splurging and buying this and buying that. No, nothing changed whatsoever. Like there was no crazy spending. There was, there, there was not like an excessive amount of cash that she carried around. It was absolutely nothing. So it was really scary because I was like, oh my God, like who is this person? So let me ask you this, with knowing all of that, you, 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 you get your process. At what point do you do you realize, holy shit, they are they were really involved with this? Holy shit. Do you remember the moment where it was like, this is it? They were this. They were involved. Like, do you remember when you made that like connection or, or thought? I I think that it got to a point that I started to just read everything on the docket. You know, I started to watch, you know, the trial I watched.
watched all of these trials. So um, I know I told you, Jay, but you know, people here don't know. Um, I've watched every single piece of the trial. I have watched it on YouTube. I have been in the chat rooms. I have commented, but nobody knows that it was me. You know, I hid behind, you know, another username just so that I can see what was going on. And a lot of the information that was released, it wasn't stuff that I was privy to. And as, as I started to see like the history, the phone calls, you know, the, the GPS, the, you know, the increase in money, the deposits, you know, when I started to analyze all of that, I was like, oh my God, like, these people really are involved. Like this is, this is regal. Like this, I am not watching TV. Like this is real. This is real life. Um, they are never, ever going to see the light of day again. So, uh, yeah, I mean, that's just wild. So, so you're watching all the evidence. Um, you're watching everything that's going on. And when do you make the realization, like it does it come in the deposition or that you were, correct me if I, you were babysitting their kids the night, the day, and the night that Dan Markell was executed. When when do you all of a sudden realize, like, holy shit, I was babysitting their kids then? Yeah, so I was pregnant at the time. So she knew that I wasn't going to be going anywhere, you know, and I never watched the kids. Honestly, she never asked me to babysit the kids. She was with the kids most of the time. Um, so if she was going out with Charlie, it was because Siegfriedo had the kids. Um, or her mom had the kids, which it was rare too, because her mom was a nurse and she worked a lot of overnight shifts. So for her to tell me to watch the kids, I was like, Hey, sure. You know, I'm pregnant. I am not going anywhere. Um, you know, you can leave them with me if you want to go on your date night. Cause that's what she said that it was. She said it was a date night and you know, that she was likely going to spend the night and if it was okay, if the kids can sleep there. And I said, Hey, no problem. So as I'm watching the trial and everything is going on, I was like, huh, I think I watched the kids sometime in July. So I go back on my Instagram because I remember I posted a picture with all the kids because I had really big bed and all the kids slept with me that day. And I had posted the picture. So I go back and I'm like, oh, my God, it was the same day. That's what that, so that. I was like, <laughs> I can't even explain to you, like, when I realized that it, it was the same day. And then the next day, she's talking to me and she's telling me how Charlie told her, hey, um, you know, that his brother-in-law got into a car accident. And now I'm realizing uh, that that wasn't that wasn't the car accident. There was that no man is dead. And you were babysitting. I mean, that's just, it's like, I, that just be like, there's some, must be so many moments you had where you're like, so the question I have now that you start realizing that, do you look back? Are there other moments where you're like, oh shit? Because like, we know that uh, Sigfredo went down more than one time. He went down twice, right? He there was more like other, other moments that you could think of that you're like any conversations you had. I know you, you kind of weren't, you, you didn't know you, but would do, looking back afterwards, are there any moments you're like, Oh crap. Katie said something to me about this or something where like it, you connected something or God. Well, I thought initially because when I met Wendy, it was father's day weekend. So it was the month before the murder. So when I find out all of this, I said, oh, my God, did they wait for me to leave to plan this? Was that what happened? Like the day that I was there, did they intentionally wait for me to leave? Maybe Sigfredo came back and it was planned. Now, I don't know if that's what happened, but always in my head, I had that thought. Maybe they waited for me to go. They planned this because Wendy happened to be there in person. They didn't have to make a phone call. They didn't have to send an email. They're having a conversation in person, um, which you would think, you know, that's the smart thing to do. Um, and that's what I thought. That's what I really thought that happened. I mean, I don't know, honestly, because from her testimony, she stated that it was all started like October, of like years past so i don't really know 
but that was always in the back of my head. Well, let's get into it. You bring up that meeting because there's so many questions I have about that meeting. You, you know, your picture is is in the trial now. It's you, Katie, and Wendy. That whole uh, everything about that. I have so many questions. First of all, how does that come up? Who sets up that? You know, you're, you're it's like a pool, right, next to the beach. Who sets that up? What what what? How does so, it come up? Yes. Okay. So what happened was we were actually at brunch. That meeting of us going over there was super last minute. Um, we were at brunch. We were eating at a restaurant that no longer exists here in Miami. But we used to love going to that brunch because we had a friend that was actually a chef there. Um, so a lot of times we would eat for like super cheap there. And the food was very good. So we're hanging out. Uh, Katie gets a text um, you know, from Charlie. It's like, hey, what are you doing? And she was like, oh, nothing. I'm having brunch uh, with Yendra. And he said, well, do you guys want to come to the pool? And Katie's like, hey, do you want to go to the pool? And I was like, I guess. Cool. Let's go. So I knew that if we were going to go to the pool, it was either at his house or it was at his parents' house because I knew that his parents had a condo in South Beach. And I was like, you know, this guy is always very, like, he splurges. You know, he was not stingy. And. And I was like, well, he's probably going to, you know, take care of the drinks if we And I was like, I don't mind. I don't have anything to do. I don't have my kid. Because um, at that time, there was only one kid. So um, I'm like, okay, cool. Let's go. You know, we stop. We get our bathing suits. And we're on our way. So we go. And, you know, we're all hanging out. And we're having a good time. And we're in the pool. And then they're like, hey, do you want to go to the beach? We can order food on the beach. And I was like, yeah, sure. Like at that point, we're hungry because it's been a couple of hours. So, you know, we ordered, I remember we ordered chicken sandwiches and we had red sangria. And, you know, we're sitting there, we're eating, we're chatting. And, you know, Charlie goes, hey, you guys should take a picture. You guys look so cute. Just, you know, like laying there, you know, getting some sun. And I'm like, sure. And we just all turn and take this picture. So that was that goes and it goes and gets posted on Facebook. And then I see it on the big screen. At Wild. Trial. Wild. So it's Charlie's idea. He wants to take the picture. Are you each, does he send it to you? Are you like each posting it social media? Is it just him posting it to Facebook? But that's Charlie's idea. No, he actually, no, he took the picture with Katie's phone. Okay. And so Katie has the picture. So Katie posts it on her Facebook and tags me on it. So I believe I reposted the picture at that time when she had tagged me in it. I didn't think it was a big deal. I was like, you know, I just met this girl, you know, Wendy. I just met her. Um, she wasn't tagged or anything. Like, they weren't friends on social media or anything like that. In my head, I thought that was maybe the first or second time they met. So I was just like, oh, it's just a casual, regular picture, you know? So I thought nothing of it. But then when I see it at trial, I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> So is so Charlie is 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 uh, taking care of all the drinks and everything. He's paying for everything. Yeah, we didn't pay anything, absolutely nothing. Like he was like, "Oh, whatever you guys want, it's fine. I got it." And it was normal, you know. This is, you know, I had only hung out with him a handful of times, and the other times he was, you know, we went out to a club once, and then another time I saw him because we were getting in the limo. He owned a limo. And for her birthday, we used the limo and he took care of the driver. He wanted to make sure everything was cool. And, you know, he met the driver and he was like, you know, make sure you take care of them wherever they want to go, blah, blah, blah. So the times that I met him, you know, he was the same way, you know, he splurged and he didn't care. So I was just like, all right, it's not a big deal. You know, I started to think about all the investment uh, properties this man had. And I was like, not only does he have plenty of investment properties, he's a periodontist. He's a specialist. Like he's not just your regular dentist. Like this man is banking. So I was like, you know, I'm a single mom on one solid salary raising a kid. And now obviously I have another kid on the way. Didn't know, but I had another kid on the way. And I was like, no deal. I'm going to have some drinks and some food. It wasn't a big deal. So, but let, uh, so this is not the first time you've hung out with Charlie. Like you said, you've hung out with him before. Give me your 
overall, before you know all this goes down, your overall impression of Charlie, is he a, a big of a dick as I think he is? He's arrogant. Like, how is he? How is he? What, what, is he the guy at the pool who's like, at, or he's, he's throwing around money. He's trying to impress everyone. Tell me what your thoughts of, of, of Charlie Adelson were at the time. So he's not throwing around the money, but if you're having a conversation with him, let's say you're having a conversation with him about a car. Okay. You're talking to him about a Porsche. He will tell you that he has a better quality Porsche than you do. <laughs> right. Like you have a Porsche, but I have a Ferrari type of situation. Right. You live in South Beach. Well, I live in Fort Lauderdale on the water. I have a boat and I have a jet ski. So things like that. So, yes, he was definitely arrogant. Um, he likes to pretty much show you like he's very smart. He knows everything about everything. Pretty much. So he's pretty much the kind of guy I would could not stand. Arrogant douche thinks he's better than everyone. Oh, uh, I would. All right. So that's the first. So that you had met Charlie before, but you had not met Wendy before. This is your first time meeting Wendy no. Adelson. Tell me about Wendy Adelson. What was she like? So funny enough, like she was super personable. Okay. Soft spoken, intelligent. Um, she was gorgeous when I met her. Um, I was, I was taken aback. I was like, wow, like this woman is gorgeous. Um, you know, she, she wasn't like, she, you knew she was smart because you knew she was smart, not because she was telling you that she was smart. Um, you know, I asked her what she did for a living. You know, she told me that she was an attorney and she was, she did immigration and sex trafficking and things like that. And I was really intrigued. I was like, oh, wow, like this woman is trying to help people out, especially, you know, with immigration, you know, I, you know, I'm an immigrant. I come from an immigrant family. I know the hardships of being an immigrant. So I was like, oh, wow, this lady's really like trying to help people out. Then I find out that the book that she had published was actually going to be used in one of the classes. And I was like, wow, she must be super smart to have a book that she published actually being used in curriculum in the school. Like, wow, this is incredible. Like, I was like, this, this chick is really cool. And she was, she was cool. Like she wasn't bragging about it. It was a regular conversation. She was drinking with us. She wasn't being like super bougie or stuck up. You know, she was a regular person. I didn't catch any weird vibes from her. So did she bring up the book? She loves to bring up that fucking book. She brought up that book in the police interview. She like, did you she, like, so she, did she brought that up? She brought up, she loves talking about that book. Yeah. So she said, Hey, you know, cause I asked her, what do you do for a living? And she's like, well, I'm an attorney. Um, you know, she, and I was like, Oh, what, you know, what specialty? Because, you know, down here in Miami, you know, you have so many different types of attorneys that you meet. Most of them are like, you know, your slip and fall attorneys, you know, things like that. So she was like, no, I do immigration and sex trafficking. Blah, blah, blah. She was like, matter of fact, like, you know, I wrote a book and, you know, my book is actually used, um, will be used at the university, you know, within the curriculum. And I was like, oh, that's really cool. She didn't really like delve into it, like, and, you know, tell me all the specifics about the book or anything like that. But she just pretty much mentions it like, hey, yeah, like I have a book and it's going to be used in school. Okay. Now let me ask you this. Uh, observing her with Katie, did they have their relationship just from that, that instance, did you think that they like, uh, did they have more relationship that you, that you were aware of at the time? Were they, they did they really like, how, how were they interacting together? Katie and Wendy? It seemed like maybe they had met maybe once or twice before, because I believe Katie had mentioned that I think they had gone to dinner before that she had come down or something like that, but she never really um, mentioned her ever. Like we never had any conversation. I mean, we really never talked about Wendy or Charlie. Um, I never even thought that it was a serious relationship. You know, she never called him her boyfriend. Really? Not once full time. You know, so I thought that this was something very casual. You know, this is Miami. If you know anything about Miami and if you know anything about people in Miami that, that are just casually dating, it was. I, I, you know, I never thought that it was a sip at any point. You know, you know, some people say, you know, that I've, I've seen this and stuff, um, you know, and people are like, 
serious relationship and she's him and he loved her you know and i honestly she never ever said that to me maybe she did um maybe she was fronting like she didn't but you know it's a serious relationship to me ever so let me ask you this so you, you talked about how this is a month this is a month before like before Dan Markell is executed this is a month before but what we what we find out later not only is this is a couple weeks before the big birthday for for Harv which we all of a sudden start realizing is a major theme especially in Charlie's trial this birthday so my question to you any discussion at this uh pool this about the the birthday party or about Harvey or anything like that? any discussion about that party that's going to be in like two weeks from there I think it, it was mm -hmm. Nothing. Zero. Find out about that um, during trial time. Okay. Um, what about uh, any discussion about Jeff Lacoste? Does, does Wendy talk about Jeff at all? Not at all. Um, you know, Jeff, I didn't even know of Jeff. I didn't even know that man existed because when I asked her i was like oh you know how come you're in miami um and she's like oh my boys are with up in tallahassee came down for father's day week i'm friendly you know i i just met the girls so i'm not over here trying a million questions about her let her you know and some people are weird about that you know you don't they don't really want you asking them a thousand questions. This girl, why am I going to tell her my life? So that was that. Like, I just was like, okay, cool. I, you know, I get it. You know, I love my dad. If my dad, I would go and visit him for Father's Day too. So I thought nothing. Okay. And all right. So then how does that, that beach party end? Like what happened? Like what happens when you go home? Like what happens when you're, when you're leaving? How does that end? Funny enough, so normally, you know, our, you know, a lot of girls here in Miami are too, but if you go somewhere with somebody, you leave with them. But that day, what happened, they wanted to hang out. I got a phone call from my kid's dad and, hey, I have to go into work um, to go drop off the baby. Um, when are you going to be home? So I was like, hey, no worries. Um, I'll just, you know, change and I'll head home. I just Ubered home or I don't know if that time it was Uber or taxi. I think it was Uber by that time. I, I'm pretty sure we had Uber by then. My way home. Um, and I told him, hey, guys, you know, I'll see you later. And I am I'm that type. I, you know, I'm not going to everybody's parade. If you guys want to stay and party and whatever, that's on y'all. Like, I have responsibilities. I'm just going to go. So you leave. And it's just Charlie, Wendy, Sigfredo, and Katie. Is that correct? Well, Sigfredo was there when I was there. I assumed that oh, gotcha, gotcha, maybe gotcha. after I yeah. left, and maybe the plan was put together. But no, they were in the pool, and they were okay, hugging, gotcha, gotcha. and you know, like, the regular stuff, you know, they were seeing. Each other. No, he wasn't there. It was gotcha. just us. Gotcha, gotcha. My bad, my bad. All right, I, um, all right. So, um, let me ask you this ma major. Let me ask you this major, major question. Why do you think Katie did this? Why did just the money? Why would she do this? Why, when Charlie Adelson said, "Hey, do you know somebody?" that can do this, why did she say, not say no? Why did she say yes? What, do you, what is your theory about that? I think um, she was in a bit of a tough spot financially. And I kind of understood her because, you know, I have kids, you know, I'm a single mom. Um, and it's hard, you know, Miami is expensive, I can tell you. Um, you know, like they say here, in Miami, two jobs and a side hustle because life here is very expensive. And I know that she wasn't getting the financial support that she really needed, you know, for her two kids. 
put in, you know, she wanted to put them in good schools, um, is special needs. And, you know, she wanted to put him in a good school. So I know that she was struggling, um, you know, mainly it was that, you know, she was like, I just want more money so that I can do more things. Um, because she really did think a lot about the children. I don't think she thought about the children at that point when she decided to do what she did. But I think that that was the driving force was that she struggles. So, but there was nothing that you could think of, like, like you had said, like, she, you know, there was nothing like that. Like, so she needs the money. It was just, just, just the money. There was nothing she had done in her past that made you think like she was capable of this, right? It was just, you just think it was just, she needed that money and, and she thought that this was an opportunity just to get that money. Yeah. Um, I never, that is, uh, like after seeing on the case, I was like, this woman is not capable of this. Like this woman doesn't even have a parking ticket. Like, how does this happen? You know, like who is this person? Who is it? So spe it, it speaking of who this person, so let's talk about speaking of who is this person. Now, all of a sudden, you're watching her testify uh, in these trials. Like you said, you watch the trials and you just know she's lying, right? What's that like for you to watch these trials and know she's just bold faced lying? So I think that her re reasoning behind the lying um, was the say Fredo was on death row. He was looking at the death penalty. So at that point, I think she was. I actually say something. I may be the cause as to why he gets the death penalty. So I reasoning behind it, but at the same time, it's like if you are able to, I'm a mother. Okay, and I will go back for my children. Okay, like no asked. And if you're giving me the opportunity, we're actually gonna be able to see my kids grow up. I am absolutely taking that. It's gonna be pretty much her fault that he was gonna get the death penalty. And she just didn't wanna live with that. Um, but I've already done bad. An innocent person is dead. I really know why she chose. To, first of all, I don't even know why she took the stand. Um, from my yeah standpoint, I I wouldn't have taken the stand. Um, I think she dug herself into a bigger hole, especially after the first trial. They had a hung jury. You know, so you're thinking in your head, wow, this is a 50-50 here. They may believe me. I may get another hung jury. But instead, you decide to get on the sand, perjurize yourself. So now what? So, so I, I thought that that was so dumb of her to play. So I, I get that for the first trial. But like, why in the second trial? He's already found guilty. Uh, and here, let me ask you this. Why would she not take the deal she was offered after the first trial, uh, you know, Sigfredo is found guilty. Why not take the deal? Why do you think she didn't take the deal? Did you think she did? She really think is she the type of person that really thought that she was going to the second jury? She was really going to convince them that she wasn't involved. Like, why wouldn't she take a deal if it, if it was offered to her? I honestly think she thought that she had this trial in the bag. Um, you know, she probably had that mindset that, Hey, I, you know, I think I convinced some, some of the people in the first trial, I think I'm going to be able to do the same thing in the second. And I don't think she took into mind that she has testified and people are listening to this and they're putting it together and how the, the kids say now, math was not mathing. It just, well, I mean, the evidence, yeah, the evidence was, was so strong. Like all the messages, all the wiretaps, all that stuff. And she, like, don't you think her counsel should probably be like, hey, I mean, ultimately it's up to her, but like, hey, we should probably take this deal. So that leads me to this question. Uh, do you think that at some point, like she is trying to not, I mean, she ultimately she did come out. She did a proffer, which did you watch her recent proffers where she, you know, and she testifies and she says, I, I was lying. But watching that, she's very hesitant. 
uh, she it's it's she, like it's pulling teeth from her. Like it almost seems to me, I don't know what your thoughts of this, that there's she doesn't want to say everything because maybe, you know, I've I've seen theories, speculation that maybe like the Adelsons are taking care of her kids. They said they're going to pay for like their school. Like, why is she so hesitant? Why isn't she flush those Adelsons down the toilet? Their guard. Like, what is what is it? What do you think? I think that she doesn't want to live with the fact of what she did and face it and know that every single day she's going to have to remind herself, Hey, I actually did this and I confess to it. So when it comes out of your mouth, it becomes real. And I think that's what it is. So if she lies about it or gives you another narrative, that's what she's believing in her head, you know? Um, and I just think that she could not, say it out loud. Okay. That, that makes sense. Um, let me ask you this. And this is by, this was sent to me by someone who has been in this community for a long time, very respected first. And they wanted to be anonymous, but this is a good question that they sent me. They wanted me to ask you, did you feel used by Katie? Do you feel, do you have any resent me resentment towards her for putting you in this position that you've had to deal with all this stuff for so long? Does, does that bother you? So at first I, I was bothered because I'm like, why would you even put me in this position? Like, you know that I have children, you know that like I am a law abiding citizen, you know, I am scared of the law. Okay. Um, you know, I, I stay out of trouble. I don't have time for it. I just don't want to deal with it. Um, so at first I was a little upset. Um, because I was like, why would she put me in this position? But then I was like, well, she never told me anything. She never put me in the position where if they come and they ask me, do you know anything that I'm going to have to speak? Never put me in that position. And matter of fact, um, after the first, not after, I'm sorry, right before the first trial, um, I had spoken to Tara once because she told me that I was both on the witness list for prosecution and for um, for defense. So I did speak to Tara um, and I had her cell phone number and stuff. And Tara told me that she, that Katie wanted to apologize to me for putting me in that position. And she was very sorry. Um, you know, and it's hard because you're torn, right? Like it's somebody that you've known all your life. It's somebody that has done so much for you because I have to be completely honest. You know, there was a lot of things that I'm very grateful that she did for me and for my family that nobody did. Um, but at the same token, you have to look at it and say, hey, you know, this is somebody that, you know, took somebody's life for no reason. And that's where you're just like, okay, pause. You know, you have to separate that. And as grateful as I am for everything that she helped me with and did for me and for my family, I don't she did in any way, shape or form. And I will never understand it, it because it's not like, not even if it's a million dollars, you know, like you're, it's not even just putting yourself in that position. Like you're never see you again outside of prison. Like, like you will not be able to attend their wedding. You will not be able to see their first children be born. Like you will not be a part in your children's lives because of the decisions that you made. And it's because there's so many innocent people involved in this. Right. So, and by the way, folks, Tara was um, Tara Kawa. She's talking about um, Katie's defense attorney for folks who don't um, know who Tara was. That's that's who Tara was. Um, and so let me ask you this at the same. So uh, talking about like kind of your feelings, do you feel at, when you're on the stand, are you feeling bad at all? Are you looking at Katie and for the first trial? Or the second, uh, do you make any eye contact with them? Do you have any any thoughts where you feel bad at all? What, what, what are your thoughts when you're up there in that yeah. courtroom? So, you know, you remember a person in a way, talking a certain way, you know, you remember all the good things, you know, all the good experience, you know, like you said, she is my kid's godmother. So, you know, she was there for my kid's birth and, and you know, did so much. So you see this person and you see them sitting there and facing the rest of their days behind concrete walls. And. I felt bad because I'm like, what did you do 
Like, why would you do this to yourself? Like, why would you put yourself in this predicament? It's unnecessary. And, and it was uncalled for. Like, you had no reason to do that. Like, I even said at one point, I was like, well, you know, you have good credit. Like, in the back of my head, I'm like, girl, you have good credit. Go and get a personal loan if you're that strapped for money. And you know what? Don't pay it back and file bankruptcy. Right. It's it's you know, never those, worth those it the, to take. A, it's not. To, to, to take a life. It's just you don't do that. Off. I mean, um, by the way, folks, we have been sharing Yundra's Twitter and TikTok. Please give her a follow on Twitter and TikTok. Uh, we appreciate her very much for being here. So we've been sharing your link, Ginger. Please get, check her out. And by the way, on her TikTok, she does a story. It, she, she, you know, she doesn't name names, but she, it's very cool. She does a story about, you know, kind of what we're, we're 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 talking about here. So please check her out on TikTok. It's very cool. Um, her story. So here's a question I have for you. It's actually another question from that person that previously I thought it was a good question. Have the Adelsons or their attorneys ever been in contact with you, and have ever tried to contact you? No. No. Okay. No. Uh, Thank and- God. <laughs> um, that was for a long time. Um, that really was one of the main reasons why I have never spoken out. Um, before Charlie was arrested, I actually had fear. You know, like these are people that have a lot of money and power. You know, when you have money here, you have power. And I didn't know what he was capable of. You know, although I've never said anything that will help anybody sink or swim at any part of this, um, you know, I didn't know if maybe in his sick mind, he would think that, you know, I was going to say something that was going to get him in trouble or put him away or whatever. And I didn't want to come out and say absolutely anything just because I didn't know what his you know, thinking was, and I was scared and he knew where I lived. It's not that he didn't know where I lived. And honestly, this is Florida. This is, you know, this is open records here. You can type in anybody's name here and get their full address in five seconds. And despite that, you still went and testified. You still told the truth. And it's why you're awesome. And we love you because that must have been scary as hell to have to testify and not one, but two trials be deposed. Like I don't think people realize how much this and and like you said, you have kids, you have schedules, you have shit to do. Your life doesn't stop when this trial starts. Like you have like so you had to like and by the way, tell the folks you almost testified at Charlie's trial, right? Talk about that. So crazy enough, every time that it was a trial, it was right around my birthday time. Literally, like the two week span the trial was in, it was around my birthday time, whether it was right before or right after. So I never wanted to be in Tallahassee for my birthday. So thankfully they were nice enough where I told them, Hey, listen, like I have this scheduled for my birthday. I will not be available these days. Please have me testify X, Y, Z day. So thankfully they were, you know, they were cool about that. Uh, Sarah was awesome. She worked with me. She was amazing. I, you know, I praise her because she was really, really cool. Um, But yes, I, surprisingly enough, so I recently moved to where I live now. Um, So in the last year, I've been living here for like a year and a half now. And I get a knock one day at the door. I am not home. My dad is home, but I see the camera. And uh, I see a court server at my door. And I'm like, hmm, that's weird. Because the first thing that I said when Charlie was arrested was, ah, there's no way I'm getting subpoenaed for this one. I met this man maybe three times, you know, or four times. What would I go to trial for? What am I testifying to? So it just didn't make any sense to me. So when I was subpoenaed, I was upset. Like this time I was pissed. I wasn't even scared, anxious. I was pissed because I'm like, I cannot believe that you guys are turning my life upside down again. Again, you know? So I call Sarah and I'm like, what is going on? Like, why am I going to trial again? You know? And she's like, listen, um, you know, it is what it is. Like you just have to come, you know, you have some details that, that we need. So I was like, okay. So it coincided that I was going out of town. Going out of town 
And I'm going to New York. I'm like, okay, I'm going to New York. I was literally flying back from New York and subsequently leaving the following day to go up to Tallahassee. That's how I was coordinated. And, you know, I get a phone call last minute, you know, 5 p.m. from Sarah. And she's like, hey, we don't need you anymore. Everything's canceled. The sigh of relief that I <laughs> gave out, I I swear to you, I, I opened a bottle of wine because I have wow. prayed to every God that I believe in <laughs> to get me out of this one. <laughs> and I was happy. I really, you know, it's it's anxiety central every time I go up there, you know, just the fact that I know that so many people are going to be watching me, you know, I've watched those streams. I see how many people log in and watch this. And I've told you this, Jay, but you know, the internet is cruel. You know, the, the internet is unforgiving. And, you know, I, like I said, I didn't want people to be like, you know, why is this girl talking about her? Why, why was she even friends with this girl? And just, you know, the judgment that would come with that. And I just really didn't want to do it. So I was very, very relieved that I didn't have to go. And the interesting thing about you when you have to testify is you don't have a lawyer. It's not like when Charlie Adelson goes up there and Rashbaum says, objection, if there's a question. No one's really got your back when you're up there. So the first, we watched the trial today. First, it's it's uh, direct. Then it's crossed with two attorneys in the first trial. Then it's a jury question. Then it's redirect. Like that's nerve. You're sitting in this little box getting grilled and you know, there's a camera on you. You probably are like, there's this camera on me. There's the jury right there watching me. So I, I can't imagine like how nerve wracking that is to have to do that. And, now, and I'm so blessed to have a big support system. Um, you know, shout out to any of my friends that are watching. They have been the biggest support system that I have ever had. Everybody tuned in. They cheered me on. They told me how great I did. Um, you know, I studied my transcript back and forth. I think I read that transcript no less than 50 times between the time that I knew I was subpoenaed to the day of. The testimony. I sat at that bench outside in that hallway reading my transcript because I wanted to make sure that I had all my facts together, all my T's crossed and all my I's dotted because I didn't want anybody to think like, hey, this girl's making stuff up or, you know, whatever, because that's not it. You know, I'm, you know, I'm telling the truth. I, I don't have anything to hide. I've never had anything to hide, thankfully, you know, but it's, it's been tough. It, I, I can't even I can't sugarcoat it. You know, it's it's been tough. Absolutely. Well, I tell you this and I see it in the chat. You have your friends, but now you have JBN, JBO Nation. We have your back. You co you want to watch a trial. Come with watch with us. No one will fuck with you on our watch. You know, we have your back. So I somewhat appreciate you doing this your first time talking to me. Um, I have another question for you. So you let's talk about you, you you have that wendy that you met at that beach in the pool right you, you and you have that person mm -hmm. what happens when you start seeing her police interview and her testimonies you're, you're a true crime follower what do you start thinking like wh how, what how is your perception of her now after you've watched all of that so i mean excuse my french but bullshit you know i i watched her interviewed and dissected that interview and i was like it's crap like if she didn't initially know about it let's just say that she didn't initially know about it she knew she knew after the fact at the very least after the fact me personally i believe that she maybe said something her mom took that tells charlie and charlie takes the big brother role and executes that's what i think happened you know she's no dummy you know she knew that just by implanting that seed especially how much her parents you know think that she's like this great person you know like you know she gets the best grades and got accepted into the best schools and the best programs the best job offers and you know she was her god system here in miami big time guy you know so they were like we're going to handle it. You know, she was used to that. She was a sport baby. So that leads me to, I, and I know I think you tweeted this, but 
what are your thoughts if like do you think they're going to get her do you think that that she will get arrested for this for this and that there'll be a trial for wendy adelson what do you think man it's up for me right so for me i think the only way that anything will happen two ways right the devices that they took um when uh donna was arrested here the devices they took so i believe they took uh two pad and a computer which the computer apparently was purchased the same month of the murder so there might be something on that computer but then again Wendy was very smart. You know, no text messages, no phone calls, no money transfers. And I believe she cut communication with her family as the murder happened. Because I remember uh, reading something where she told her mother, like, you know, I was told by my address. And I think she just cut it all off. And I think that she did most of her communication in person. Because she on a regular basis, because her mother would pick up her children from school. So I think that a lot of the conversation was done in person. Now, anything, I think Georgia is playing the waiting game, and she's probably going to do the thing that she did previously. She's going to wait. Donna gets you know convicted, and then boom, Wendy gets arrested. Right. Well, let me. The right. other theory that I have is. If any, if anybody was to flip at this point, I honestly think Donna would. Because I think she yeah. feels some type of way that her daughter doesn't speak to her. her. Um, she's angry at the fact that, she, that uh, you know, that she's making it seem like she has nothing. I recall listening to one of the jail calls where she pretty much under her breath said that, you know, yes, you did. Yes, you did have involvement. I don't know that uh, a phone call, yeah. well, but there's a part of it reading off a message. And, and she's like, Wendy, you have a lot to think about, don't you? Like, yeah, I, she uh, she definitely does not think that Wendy is appreciative for what, for what Donna has done for her, Grandma Gotti. She is definitely not happy with that and 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 because 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 now when he's like she's not talking to them she wants donna wants to talk to her like just about like other shit and when he's like i'm not fucking talking my counsel told me not to talk to you i mean it's a wild wild dynamic um so so i here's a, crazy. Of, you know you were just talking about like your friend the, um go ahead sorry oh i was just no, gonna say no, um I, I go ahead go ahead all right. I was going to say, you know, you were talking about your friends and you have a, you know, a good support system. But what I'm curious about, so you, you guys kind of, you know, you grew up together, like you, you went to the same high school. Like, is there any sort of like Facebook pay group or like a group chat or is there anything when all this is going down? Like, are you talking to other friends who like went to the high school and other, like, is there any sort of conversation you guys are having? Like, holy shit, did you guys see this? Like, that must be like massive. So put it this way. Um, you know, we used to go a lot, you know, I don't go too much anymore because, you know, we've gotten older now, but we used to go to Wynwood a lot. And, you know, if anybody here knows what Wynwood is, you know, it's like an up and coming area over here where they have a lot of bars and, you know, clubs and restaurants and stuff. And I would run into a lot of people, you know, Miami is big, but it's small, especially Miami Beach. So if you grew up in Miami Beach, we all went to the same high school because there was only one high school in Miami Beach, public high school. Everybody went to that school. It's a massive school. Um, and I would run into people. And I literally would walk around with that diagram that they first showed where it had, you know, all the players shown on this diagram so that I can explain to people the case. Because people would just see me and be like, hey, how's Katie? What do you think about the case? So that was every single week. Till this day, I get messages from people like, what do you think is going to happen? You know, when she testified and everybody was like, oh, my God, did you watch? And, you know, so till this day, I still have people. I have people that message me. Um, I have random people that have recognized me and just be like, hey, you're so and so. And I'm like, I am. So it's there. there's not a day that goes by that somebody's not asked, um, you know, my children. Uh, I have a teenager and now starting to ask more questions. Quite 
small when this happened. Um, my little one, not that much because she doesn't have social media or anything like that. But my big one saw my TikTok and she's like, who's Maria? And she's all types of confused. And she's like, who are these people? Story, um, you know, but yeah, everyday thing pretty much still. Uh, for folks who don't know, she used Maria on her TikTok as as a as a pseudonym because she wasn't she was she was not. If you're wondering who that is, she didn't name names on there, so that's why her daughter was asking that. So here's another question I have. I, by the way, if you have to go, tell me because we've been on for like an hour and ten minutes, and I, I know you. I don't want to keep you on for for too long. No, um, no, no. My kids are uh, my kids are sleeping, and the, you might hear uh, snoring in the background. It's it's my little dog. He's snoring too, so we're good. All right, awesome. So here's a question I have. So you're a big true crime fan, right? You are a big you. You follow these cases. So I'm curious. In 2014, when this when you when this is hitting the news, are you at all saying to just like because you know Katie's your friend? Like, are you just saying, hey, did you see this? Have you seen this case that's going on? Do you ever bring that up to her? Um, because it's a true crime case that you follow. So I came up. I came across it right. But like I said, I wasn't putting, you know, in the original, like, things that would come out, they didn't say, oh, Dan Mark is, uh, you know, Wendy's husband or ex-husband. That They didn't depict that articles originally. They're, they're saying, you know, that this is a case. They don't, um, you know, obviously when he gets arrested, when Sigfredo gets arrested, they're like, you know, that's been going on for two years and that's when i start putting you know the puzzle Ooh, i was just like man they killed this this happened you know i was like super lost in the sauce i was like what's going on you know but it, it wasn't anything major to right. me because also it wasn't a local thing and it really didn't blow up honestly until 2016 so in 2016 when the first arrest was made now it's a huge thing and now there's connections from tallahassee to miami and you're like wait what's going on so that's really when things started going and i was just like super taken aback yeah i bet and i i, I we touched on this a little bit about the fbi but when you realize like i'm just trying to think about that moment where the fbi you realize that that white van that has been out of your outside of your house for so long has been surveilling you. What is that moment? Are you thinking about every conversation you've had, everything you've done? Like, what is that moment like when you realize that you have been surveilled by the Federal Bureau of Investigations for over a year? What is that moment like? What are you thinking? Man, I what? Like, I was like, listen to literally every conversation I have ever had on this phone. Probably seen every single text message. At a point, you're like, oh my God, it's so embarrassing. Because, you know, a lot of times with your friends, you know, there's no TMI with your friends. You know, you say whatever with your friends. I think at that time, I was, you know, going through a rough patch with, you know, my kid's dad and stuff. So a lot of the conversation was about that. Um, a lot of complaining about my pregnancy, you know, so talking about things that were happening to me to my body while i was pregnant so i was like jesus christ like these people have listened to absolutely everything of my life like they know all the ins and outs here they know my schedule they know what my kid looks like they know what my father looks like they know what my kid's dad looks like um they know when i've had a party when i haven't who i've brought to my house like it gets to the point you're like wow you, i've been watched for a whole year a whole year and like when you sit down and you think about it now you're like okay you know but back then it was it was a big shock it, it was a lot it was heavy yeah i bet now it's talking about yeah. thinking back what the moment when when uh, do you have any thoughts of like when when katie comes back that next day so so she messages you there's a car you know dan markel was in a car accident is she acting weird at all when she comes back and gets her kids? Is it anything that you're like, you think back now, now and like, oh, that makes like nothing? Nothing, nothing. Wow. That is, I think that that is the scariest part of this. Um, there was no change in this woman, you know, not one, 
you know, she, she it was normal. It was normal conversation. She's just, just like, you know, Charlie told me that his brother-in-law was in a car accident. Um, he should be okay. And I never asked ever again, because since she said, oh, he said he should be okay. I thought nothing of it. I didn't know who this man was. Again, I had only spoken to Charlie a handful of times. So it wasn't a big deal, you know, but it, it was crazy. It was crazy because I look back now and I'm like, the fact that nothing changed, no demeanors changed, no habits changed, no spending habits changed. That was a big thing because, you know, you see other defendants in, in the case where there's splurging and there's per big purchases and stuff like that. No, you know, this girl was going about her life, how she normally went about her life. There wasn't any crazy shopping sprees. There was nothing. And I was with this woman almost every single day. So I can tell you. It's wild. It's wild to me because I mean, I would never do something like this. But even like, I, I would probably when I came to pick up my kids, I probably would have been sweating bullets. Like, uh, uh, did anyone? Did you get any calls? Or did anyone? Like, I don't know. Like, I, I get, like for her to like just have that ability to completely not show. Like, you're her like best friend, right? And you have no idea that is. Yeah, and then you say, well, you say, well, you know, the whole thing everybody talks about, you know, like her getting her breasts done, right? That still wasn't a red flag because she had spoken about this breast augmentation for a very long time. Um, if you knew her in high school, you would know that since high school, she wanted to do it. So her getting her breasts done wasn't even a red flag because I'm like, well, you know, she's working the, you know, the club job. She's saving up her cash and hey, she's getting her breasts done. She's doing what she wants to do to make herself feel better. So that wasn't even a red flag because a lot of people will ask me that. Hey, but, you know, she got this boob job. Didn't you think that that was a red flag? And I'm like, no, I really didn't. You know, we were getting paid cash and I was putting away all this money, too. You know, I was saving to move. And I mean, she wasn't saving to move. She was saving for her boobs. That was what I thought in the back of my head, you know? What, what about, did you find it odd at all that despite breaking up, that she maintained, Katie maintained contact with Charlie get and, and also gets the car, right? Gets her, Tarv's car, the Lexus. Did, did that uh, have any, did you think that was kind of weird that she just kept being in contact with him after they broke up? Well, for me, I felt like it was more like a business transaction, right? This man has money. I'm pretty. It's interesting. He's going to buy me stuff. You know, in Miami, you know, sucks to say it, but it's normal. A lot of pretty girls here have me. Um, even men that are giving the money that they're not sleeping with. Interesting. Okay. All right. Um, here's, here's another question. My theory mm -hmm. is that, and I want your thoughts on this, is there is no way that Sigfredo only went down two times because they talk about how like he didn't even need a map. He, he didn't have any GPS and he was just able to find, you know, all the places without anything, basically. Do you think it's possible there was more than the two trips and possibly maybe Katie went on a trip? Because I, I kind of do you think what, what do you think? Do you think that he only went down there twice and he just knew that area so well? Well, one thing I will tell you about him, he's actually very good with directions, right? So he didn't have to go places many times to remember. Where everybody, everybody knew that. Everybody knew that he, he had like a map in his Because regardless of, you know, obviously they were the way that they actually followed through with this, this murder. Um, he was a smart guy in, in other things, you know, in other aspects of his life with remembering directions so it is possible that he had been up there you know more he did break up for a good amount of time and you know up there honestly i was with her like i said i think that if she would have gone out of town i went to dominican republic um and when she went to dominican republic she went with him so i knew she was out of town uh, I had her location. She had my location. So okay. I, I don't think at any point oh, so you she'll be there at all. I don't think she ever went up. 
Okay. Here's another thing I, I want to talk about. In the latest trial, with, there's the moment. I'm curious your thoughts. The moment when Katie's on the stand and she's talking about how the money is wet. And, and she's like, Sigfredo, the money is wet. What the fuck? And Sigfredo's like, I don't give a shit. Just put, can you, can you, I'm just curious if like, you know them. Did you like picture that in your head, that interaction between them? I'm curious what, what when that happened, what your thoughts were. I honestly could picture him telling her, like, I just separate the goddamn money, give it to whoever the fuck on, you know, excuse my French. Um, but I'm pretty sure that's exactly how oh, it went. Good. He was very to the point, um, very, you know, like he is not, you know, not with the bullshit, basically, you know, this is it, get it done. That's it. And don't talk about it. Just don't talk about it anymore. That's it. Let's not talk about it anymore. <laughs> and from what I understand, he started to drink a lot after that. After, do you remember that period afterwards? He was like drinking a ton. Like, do you, it, it was it like, do you think it was just like it psychologically like this really affected him? Like, do you, do you remember that at all after, after the murder, him like drinking a lot or did he always drink a lot? No, he didn't really drink too much. Um, you know, I know that he delved into drugs. Um, she did not um, at all from, you know, from what I knew, she never, ever did drugs around me. And I knew of the drugs because she told me about it, not because I actually saw him doing it because he never did him, you know, any drugs in front of me or in front of my children. Like I said, he was always very respectful um, to me and to my kids. So I knew because she did complain about it. She didn't like it, you know, so I, I do think that he did start to pick up more drinking because I did start to notice like when I would go over there to the house when they moved to the new place that, you know, he was drinking when I would go by. And, you know, it, it was weird because I'm like, you know, he doesn't really drink much. I never really see him drinking much. So I did find it weird, but I was like, hey, maybe he's stressed out. He got a new job. So, you know, I, I kicked it to that. I was like, oh, you know, maybe he's just stressed out. You know, they just moved. They had to spend this money to move and he got a new job. So that's what I chalked it up to. Oh, I, I meant to ask you this question. Another thing that happened. I'm dying to get your thoughts when you first hear the defense bring up the fact that this is a double extortion and there's some sort of, uh, you know, payment plan. What were you thinking when you first heard that? Man, I, I I was dying to see what his defense would be because I had an, I had a feeling. I had a feeling that he was going to do a, you know, they were blackmailing me. Like, that's, that's the first thing I thought he was going to say, oh, they were blackmailing me. But, you know, if you know, you know. No criminal is putting you on a layaway plan. <laughs> it's not going to. Okay, this is not Kmart. This is not Walmart. Okay? Like, this is Miami. Okay? So a criminal out here, you're trying to get him to do something, you better pay. Because if not, they're going to find you. And things are not going to be pretty. So when that defense was, first and foremost, um, you know, I'm not an attorney, obviously. But <laughs> the hired an attorney from Miami and decided not to get counsel see, does not sit well with me because yes, you have counsel from Miami because you're, you're familiar with Miami, but this counsel, your counsel is not familiar with Tallahassee. He doesn't know those judges clerks. He doesn't know how those people work. It was dumb on his part. And he thought that, you know, paying all this money, for you know his his uh, jury expert and all of that, that that was gonna do anything for him. The theory was shit. Let's yeah, be honest. It really was. The theory. I mean, was that's shit. why. That's why it, it took the jury like two hours to come back with the guilt with the guilty verdict. I mean, plus, what did you? Th By the way, what did you? Th you met him a few times. What did you think of him on the stand? What were your thoughts when you're watching him testify? I can tell you that that man put that defense together and wrote all of this down from day one of being arrested and rehearsed that till the day of the trial. Like if he was studying for school. He sure down, he sure That's had it, it down pat. He, he rehearsed he it. The... He rehearsed it. 
Absolutely. He did oh. not trip up. He did not trip up. You know, it's something that if you read something over, it's like you're in school. You know, you're reading your notes over and over and over and over again. That's what you're going to remember. You know, and if you have a year, because he he had been sitting there for about a year, you have a year to review all of this and you're writing down every question that you can think that you, you may be asked and every possible answer and you review that for a year, you're going to have a storyline. And it gets to the point that these type of people, the storyline that they put in their head, they're going to believe. And he believes everything that he is saying. And he thinks that everybody else is going to believe what he is saying because he's believing what he's saying, although it's not the truth. Right. And because he's a narcissist sociopath. So he he just thinks everyone he thought everyone in there was just eating it up. Yum, yum, yum. They just love him and his attorney. They just thought they just and it's so awesome how quickly it came back. And they're like, we're not dumb, you idiot. Two hours. We we th there was probably a half hour was just a snacking because we hate you because you're dumb. Let me ask you this now. Donna, Ad Donna mm -hmm. Adelson. First of all, what did you think of when all the stuff came out about Donna and what a freaking monster she is? What are your thoughts on, on Donna Adelson? What I will say to you is that I am so happy that um, the day that I went to the pool, it was the bill. It was her building. It was the downstairs of her building. Um, and when I got that phone call from my ex telling me, hey, um, you know, I have to go drop off the baby. Um, I need you to come home. Instead of going upstairs to their apartment to change my clothes and do all of that, I decided to use the bathroom in the lobby and not go upstairs because I was like, you know, I don't know these people. I'm not going up there. I'm not friending like that. And then again, you know, I had like my witchy vibes going, <laughs> you know, like the flies were going off. You know, and I was like, mm, I don't know if I want to meet these people. And now I'm thankful for it because I don't think I'll be subpoenaed for this case, you know, for her trial. Um, I literally have not had one conversation with this woman ever in my life or with Harvey. So, you know, let's say Harvey was to be, you know, arrested for whatever we took, which that's another thing. I don't ever I don't think Harvey will be arrested, honestly, um, you know, but. I thank God that I never had any interaction with her uh, because now I know that I'm not going to be subpoenaed because I'll be damned. <laughs> think of, well, thank your intuition because you had that, you were like, these people are a little sketchy. Imagine you would have went up there. God, I mean, who, what, what would have been talked about? Like just meeting the, these monsters, like good. <laughs> like, uh, that's a moment you look back and you're like, Ooh. yeah, it's crazy. Like I watched. So the, night that she was arrested um you know typically i'm not up that late because i wake up every day at 5 30 in the morning i have very early days so you know 9 p.m you know 10 p.m maybe 10 30. i'm like okay guys it's bedtime but for whatever reason that day i was on twitter and twitter was hot that night and i was like man what's going on you know and it was like talks about possibly her getting arrested. And I was like, man, I, I'm going to stay on. Some Something's going to happen here, you know? And I remember it was like 11-ish at night. Yep. And man, I was like, no way this is happening. <laughs> I was like, this is happening. This, this is awesome. You know? And I was like, yes, because at the end of the day, granted, you know, like she's my friend and everything, like I've said, but I don't condone what she did. I don't condone what anybody in this case did. And I feel that every single person responsible in this case needs to be arrested, needs to do the time because it's unfair, you know, and a lot of talk, you know, and I know that we don't want to talk about the whole racist thing and, you know, we don't want to put that into a group, but I've read a lot of comments where people say, well, you know, the Brown folk, were arrested, you know, the Spanish people or whatever, the minority was arrested and these rich white folk were not. And that didn't sit well with a lot of people, at least here locally. They're like, well, if they're going to arrest these people, they got to arrest those people too, just because they have money. That doesn't mean that you're not responsible. Absolutely. I'm glad. It's not. I'm fair. glad you brought that up. It's absolutely true. And I'm glad you, I mean, why? Why did they? They went down so fast, and all of a sudden, these people in there, as as uh, as uh, Wendy likes their ivory towers, like she climbed. They were in the ivory towers. Wendy and Donna 
and, and Harvey and Charlie, they never thought, and th th I think their whole process is like, listen, if we do this and they do, if they get caught, they'll go down, but we're never going down. And, and really, thankfully, for people like you. Listen, Charlie truth, was out here. Charlie was out here living his best life. Let's be completely honest. You know, these people get picked up in 2016. Charlie is living his best life, traveling, having a child, um, out partying. I went to an event, a charity event um, at a, you know, a place here and Charlie was there. Okay. He did not see me because I was on the other side, but I saw him. And funny enough, that evening they posted like pictures and videos of the event and he was there and I saw it like it's him, you know, so he's out here living his best life. Um, you know, some people passport bro. If you guys know, you know, um, you know, going out here to these countries and, you know, picking up these young men or whatnot, um, his best life and everyone's rotting in jail, you know, rightfully so because they should be in prison, but so should you. Why aren't you in there? Absolutely. Absolutely. And so glad he went down. I'm so glad Don is going to go. There's no, to me, Charlie went down. How could they not? The, the whole time I'm watching, uh, I don't know about you, but the whole time I'm watching Charlie's trial, I'm like, this is essentially Donna's trial because everything and and they're bringing up more. I mean, how they're going to, she's going to go down and let, let's fingers crossed. I know you, you don't think Harv's going to go down. Well, I mean, because Harv, first of all, it's his car, right? Didn't she get hit? And second of all, he had to know about the checks that, that Donna's writing, right? There's no way he doesn't know about. You don't think they have enough for him? I honestly don't think they have enough because I think if anything, if they would have anything and they would try to charge him with anything for me, it would be maybe accessory after the fact. Because maybe he found out after the fact and just never spoke up about it, right? But I don't think he had prior knowledge of it. I think maybe they gave him the narrative of, you know, we're trying to help this girl out. So we're giving her these paychecks. And, you know, they spun the whole thing of her needing help, you know, for public assistance or whatnot. And, you know, her car did have a lot of problems. Because that I can tell you, I was in that car plenty times. And that car did have a lot of issues. Um, the Mazda that she had. So maybe he thought he was just being nice and Hey, you know, I'm helping this girl out. She's, you know, she's a single mom. She was his patient as well. Um, so maybe she had some conversations with him and he felt sorry for her and just tried to help her out. So I think if he found out it was after the fact and maybe he did know. And then of course, you know, he's been with this woman for how many years? I mean, I think Wendy said, you know, 40 years or something, maybe 30, 40 years, you know, he's going to stick up for his wife. Ultimately, yeah. you know, that's all he has. He has his wife and his children. His children are grown. You know, they're living their own life. So his wife is, is who he's going to stick up for. And I think that that's why when they booked these flights, he was like, I'm going with you. Where, what am I going to stay here for? For what? Well, well, uh, good point here by Judy, who says, Never say never. They got his own his iPhone, his uh, phone and iPad recently. And let's think about these are the folks who don't even realize that they're being recorded as they talk <laughs> on on jail recorded phone calls. So God, what they found in Harvey and Donna's, like you said before, what they found on those electronics. Oof, I cannot wait to to see that. Um, Wesley says, uh, "Tell us how you really feel." This is how, and I've said this before. This is how I really feel. And you kind of pro they thought they were so above the law. The Adelson, so I can't stand Donna, Harvey, Wendy, Charlie. They thought that they were so above the law. They got away with so much shit that since they were losing in this divorce thing, it wasn't going their way, that they could get away with murder. And like you said, they used some people of color to do their dirty work, and they never thought this was going to happen. And it took a little while, but finally they are going down. And like I said, it's for people like you, Indra, who who had to testify when they didn't want to, and, and Jeff Lacoste, and people who got caught in this web. That they, like, this is just your friend. You had no idea this is your friend. And then all of a sudden, you are in a trial. You're in two trials, subpoenaed, deposed. The FBI is at, like, so uh, again, I have to thank you. I mean, this has been amazing. It's been over an hour and a half. Yindra, I, I know yeah. I've been looking at the chat. You have a ton no, of new fine. fans. No, it's fine. It's okay. I'm actually really enjoying this. I'm enjoying the questions. I don't mind answering them. It's cool. Um, you know, I just, I also, you know, I feel bad, you know, for my kids, 
you know, so I have a teenager who she's very, she's different, you know, she's quiet. She doesn't ask too many questions. You know, she's into her own thing. Now I have the young one, which is Katie's goddaughter. Um, and she's a little bit more inquisitive, right? Um, so a couple of years back, um, you know, she asked me randomly, like, you know, where's Thea Katie? Because, you know, she called her Thea Katie. And uh, I, I was honest. I, I don't lie to my children. You know, whether I hold back on details, yes, because if I don't feel that they're going to be able to process it completely and understand it fully, there's really no reason to bring it up because they're going to be like, huh, what? So a couple of years ago, you know, she asked, she was like, well, where's the Arcadian? And I said, well, she's in jail, you know? And she was like, oh. And then she goes, so it was like around Earth Day. And I mean, well, is she in jail for littering? You know, she's an, you know, th these are the things that she She's thinking because she knows that that you shouldn't do it and it's bad for the earth, you know? So she's like, well, she's in jail for littering. And I, I just looked at her and I was like, she's not in jail for littering. And, you know, she was like, well, what is she in jail for? Because she wants to know, you know, my kid just wants to know. And I was honest and I told her, listen, for littering, she's in jail for something else. Um, but we can't talk about that right now because you're not going to fully understand it. So we're going to talk about it one day. And she goes, well, do you promise? And I said, yes. And I will. I will eventually have to tell her why she is in jail and for her to understand it. But I essentially told her, you know, it's, you know, she broke the law. And when you break the law, you go to jail. And that's it. But it sucks because, you know, she'll see pictures, you know, like old pictures. Sometimes like, you know, I have pictures on my phone that are very old. And then sometimes, you know, when you have like those memories that come up on the phone, sometimes, you know, a picture will come up and it'll be a picture of us at dinner when my kid was an infant. And she'll be like, oh, that's me. And that's Katie. And, you know, she's like pointing at her, at, at you know, Katie's kids. And it's, it's heartbreaking, you know, because it's like, you never, ever going, like your kid is never, ever going to have that relationship with their godparent because of choices that ultimately she made. Right. Here's a question I have for you from uh, Judy. When was the last time uh, you talked to Katie? Uh, did you try to reach out to her after Katie was put in jail slash uh, prison? So I did speak to her a couple of times via email because they have iPads there. Um, and you're able to talk to them through like a, a portal that they have, you know, that they do monitor and stuff like that. But honestly, it was very regular talk. I have never, ever spoken about the case or details of the case or anything like that, especially because number one, she was um, appealing. Uh, number two, Charlie's case was ongoing. And I knew that I likely maybe was going to be subpoenaed and I did not want to talk about the case. So yes, I've spoken to her a couple of times, maybe three or four times. Um, and I did speak to her once on the phone. Um, we had a conversation. It, you know, it was very weird to hear her voice because I had not heard her voice in so many years. Um, like that, you know, personally on the phone, of course, I have heard her, you know, in the trial when she spoke, when she testified, but actually having a personal phone conversation with her, I hadn't. In, in many years, but we have not spoken in a while. Um, the last time I spoke to her was, I think, right before her second trial. I haven't spoken to her since. Did she apologize to you? Like she told her Tara to apologize to you? Did she actually say, I'm sorry? She didn't. On the phone, she didn't. You know, she had told that to Tara, like that was from the first trial, like when I, we were going to go, I was going to go and testify and stuff in the first trial, but no, she didn't. Um, I really didn't even want to go into it um, on the phone. I really didn't even want to talk about it. You know, like I, I've gotten to the point that now I'm just like, you know, it is what it is, you know, like nothing ever, ever is ever going to change, you know, and it sucks 
because you would hope that this would have never happened and that all these innocent lives wouldn't have been turned upside down. Um, it's, it's just an unfortunate situation for everybody involved, especially for the victim's family more than anybody else. And of course, the children involved, because it's not just, you know, Dan's children. It's, you know, it's Katie's children. It's Charlie's child. You know, it's it's a lot. Right. They had no, they had, they're innocent. They had nothing to do with any of this. And now they're they're in this situation. Uh, I can't believe I didn't ask this question. Yeah. Uh, what what was the your what did you think when when you find out that Katie is is going to is going to tell a different story? Like When you first found that out and that she's going to testify like did that, that must have blown your mind after two trials where and, and like you said, she's appealing. And all of a sudden she's like, I'm going to I'm going to what were you what did you think when that happened when you found that out? I was like, well, this is dumb. You know, you you perjurize yourself. Like, what are we doing? You know, especially not only is it the fact that she perjurized herself, she's hurting her appeal because you're blatantly saying that, you know, I lied. So now when you're doing your appeal, what are you what are you doing? You know, like what's happening here like this is not smart this is not smart and from the very onset like i have a friend um who's an attorney and you know she's been keeping up with the trial as well um she's probably watching um because she wanted to tune in it and everything but um we had this conversation and she was like you know the worst thing she could have done was go on that stand she probably would have had a better chance if she would have completely stayed quiet and then now spoken out and said the whole story. I think that maybe they would have offered her some sort of deal, even now, after the fact. Because from what I understand, she hasn't been offered anything. Right. So do you think she did it in the hopes that she'll get a deal and, and just somehow be able to see her kids one day? Is like, is, you think that's the, the the overriding thought behind her doing that? Or is it yeah, something else? Yeah, I think... I think in the back of her head, at the very least, maybe um, they'll tell her, hey, at least maybe they'll move her down to a prison that's closer to home. And that way, it's going to be easier for her children. His son is about to be an adult. You know, so he can make that decision if he wants to go and, and see his mom. And, you know, at this point, her children are old enough to Google and know exactly what happened and, and what's going on. You know, you can't lie to your kids. You can only lie to them to a certain point when they get to the, you know, the age that they're at, you know, my nine-year-old knows how to use Google, you know? So I'm pretty sure that these kids know exactly what their parents have done. There's no, oh, she's in, you know, they're in Thailand working or, or whatever the story was in the, you know, like her children very much are aware of of what's going on so at the very least maybe she hopes that prison that's closer and then that way her children can visit her because from what i understand her children to visit her oh wow okay uh here's another question that was sent to me uh knowing both yeah. katie and sigfredo if it's true katie owns sigfredo's heart why won't he help her now by talking do you think sigfredo will he has never said anything do you think he'll ever come out and say offer anything for, to the state at all, or he's just going to do his time? He's going to do his time. That, that man will never speak. I can tell you that much. Nothing. Nothing. Nothing will ever come out. If anything, encouraged her to throw him under the bus. Mm. Very interesting. Yes, Brooklyn says um, project... Proje Comments, you guys uh, are so sweet. Protect. We are going to protect uh, Yindra at all costs. You can. Uh, you come in our chat. Anyone fucks like I said, we, we will take them down. Um, man, I, I think. Do, do, are there any questions, folks? <laughs> I miss. I have so many questions, but I think you have been so. This has been such an amazing interview. And again, I I can't thank you enough for for being me, being the first person that you came on and talked to. Uh, let me ask you: Is there anything, maybe any points that like? I'm, I haven't brought up or anything that you've thought of about this case that maybe people aren't like thinking about that you've thought about? Not really. It's gotten to the point here that I want our peers and people that know her, her and know of the case like this to be over. Like We are over. <laughs> We're done with seeing 
seeing these trials, like we just want arrested. Um, we dying for Wendy to be arrested, to be completely honest. No, oh, I can't hear you. You break it up a little. I can't hear you. Can you guys hear? Test. Can you hear me? Uh oh. Oh. You there, Yinch? Can you hear me? Oh, no. Hold on, guys. We'll see if uh, I think Yinja's fixing her. Can you hear me? Now I can hear you. Guys, while we're waiting for her to fix her mic, please follow Yinja on Twitter and TikTok. Just give us a second. She's just going to fix her, her microphone. I think we might have a little bit of a bad connection here. Oh, no. I think, I think, I think. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. All right. So I think we got cut off. We are dying for Wendy. That those are what those are what I want to hear. You were dying. You're dying for Wendy to go down, right? Like you, that's the like she's got to go down, right? Is that that's what you're saying? That is the goal. Like that is the goal. I am praying that even if they find like one email, one email, anything, something that will connect her. Because it's just not as received life insurance, social security, pension. This woman is ruling in money off of the death of her spouse. Like she's children's father for what? And she's out here living her exactly. best life. You know, and everybody's rotting in own mother is rotting in jail what relationship you have with your mother your mother is rotting in jail your mother is 70 i fear that that woman wouldn't even make it to trial to be completely honest with you I so yeah. you know we just want this to be over i want her to get arrested and that's it. Like, we just, I want to put this in the back of my head. I mean, obviously, I'm never going to be able to put it in the back of my head. This is probably the experience I have ever dealt with in my life that I can think of. You know, seeing my face, you know, on all over YouTube, you know, Googling my name and seeing all these things, it's very surreal. Very surreal. Um, and I know it's never going to ever go away. And it's something that I'm going to have to deal with and, and see, you know, for the rest of my days. But, you know, you just want it to be done. Like, I really want these people to have the justice that they need. His family needs to have full justice, not the justice that they have now. They need full justice. Amen. Let me ask you this. Do you, I, I know this is there's a lot. There's talk about Wendy having WhatsApp. Do you think there's any way Wendy had WhatsApp and was at all communicating with uh with with katie do you think that's a, a, at all a possibility 100 percent, 100 percent. um back then i know that now it's a little different um and they've updated their software a little bit where there is a way to retrieve messages but i know back then when whatsapp first came out was fully encrypted you erase and it's gone you know so i'm pretty sure that yeah she plays it as, oh, I don't remember. I don't know, you know, you know, deer in headlights kind of situation. You know, she wanted to make it seem like she was so innocent and such a victim. And I didn't know anything about this. And I only know my brother did this because I, I read it. I read, it, you know, so it's crap. Oh, she's such a liar. It's so infuriating. I mean, no, you must it infuriates me. You're involved in this. It must infuriate you even more, huh? Yeah. 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 Because at the end of the day, it's like, you have to just look at it from the standpoint of, and I keep on going back to this. It's like these children lost parents. You know, I, I don't know what I would do if I would put myself in a predicament where my children would not be able to have me, you know, and I would never put myself 
myself in a predicament where I would be taken away from my children for some stupid choice like that. And for her to think that it's okay, you know, to do this just because of what? Because of a few miles that you can drive it? Not even drive it. You have the money to fly back and forth every single week if you want to. Such a good point. But instead, you try to take the easy way out and get rid of this man. For what? It, it, you know, it was, it was uncalled for. So let me ask you this. You're, you're just talking to you and watching you, you know, you're very personable. Everyone, we, we all love you here. You're awesome. Would you ever think about, like, doing your own podcast about the, what you went through or or a book or anything like that? Have you have you ever had any thoughts about that, like yourself doing that? Funny enough, I was having a conversation with a friend today. Um, and I do think I want to do a podcast. I'm actually was thinking about some names today that I would maybe name it. Um, I would, th I would, I think I would just have to figure out how to do it all. I'm like, you know, I'm a little technology savvy, but not that much. So I guess I would have to figure out exactly how I would do it. And obviously a catchy name and, you know, have more followers, obviously, because you have to have an audience. But yeah, I would definitely like to do that, especially like to delve into like different cases and stuff like that. I think it would be great. Um, I'm not very, um, I'm not really shy per se, you know, um, I dance professionally for many, many years. Uh, so I'm used to big audiences and, you know, and, and traveling and performing and things like that. So that for me is not, a, you know, a big deal. And, you know, I, I get along with a lot of people. I talk to anybody and everybody. I make friends. I go out and hang out by myself. You know, like I'll go to, you know, a local bar or, you know, I go and I play bingo on Thursdays at a <laughs> at a little brewery here by my house and I've made friends, you know, things like that. So, yeah, I would definitely think about doing either, you know, a podcast or something of the sort uh, where I would delve into cases and stuff like that. Or even this case, you know, start out with this case just because I have the personal yes. knowledge of the case, especially with the uh, trial coming up. Absolutely. Well, first of all, as someone who just started doing YouTube a year ago, you could definitely do it. If you need any help, I got your back and all of us will promote the shit out of it. So definitely if you have any, you know, I'll help you. We'll help you. So it's now we're coming on two hours. This has been absolutely amazing. I, first of all, everyone who's been here, thank you so much for, for watching us and, and being here for this. Yindra, thank you so much. I mean, I, I feel honored and just that you would do this. You would do your first interview with me. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to give you the full, any, any, any final thoughts, any final words you want to say before, before we end the, uh, the interview, any of the stream or anything like that. No, thank you guys for having me. Um, I was a little nerve wracked. I know when we first came on and we were talking, Jay, I was like, oh my God, I have the bubble guts. This is crazy. But you know, this was great. Um, thank you guys for all the great compliments, um, that you guys gave me. Uh, that was awesome. Thank you guys for all the follows. I've been getting like a whole bunch of buzz yes, awesome. <laughs> on my phone here. You know, people follow me and stuff. And definitely um, check out my TikTok too. I think that it was pretty entertaining. And I'm like in my zone. I'm like literally in my robe in one of them. And like piece thing that I wear to like my makeup and stuff. Because, you know, this story requires wine sometimes. Um, so other than that, thank you guys so much for having me. Um, um, you know, I appreciate everything. Um, and I'm I'm excited about this. I'm ready. I want a sense it's going to be like Anna. And I I I highly doubt that she would try to use the same defense, but I feel like that's the way that it's going. Oh, I kind of I want her to just because I just want to I mean they this Roush bomb has them like has them in like a trance. Like he they got a guilty verdict within like less than two hours and they decide to use them again. Are you have you lost your minds? But he has them like and, and he's doing interview. I mean, don't even get me started. That's a whole nother, but I I, well, I hope you'll watch with us, by the way. I'm gonna be streaming it. I hope you'll watch with us. We'll have you in the chat. We'll chat with you, and maybe you'll come on. We can talk if you want to. Yeah, you could be like a consultant, you know, talk about it. Um, yeah, folks, we've been. If you're on the replay crew, in the in the description is Yindra's Twitter and TikTok. And yes, her TikTok is great. She she does a story and she talks about it. So please check her out on TikTok. Like it, comment, get it in the algorithm, like we always say. Um, all right, guys, I think that's it. Yindra, again, thank you so much. Thank you everyone so much for being here. Uh, have a good night, and we'll uh, we'll catch you on the next one.